I will talk to you about Amnesty's past, and I'm appropriately bearded for that, that occasion. Um, we had a major experience with comprehensive immigration reform back in the 80s and the 90s, and we should review what we learned or should have learned before entering those waters again. Uh, let me outline what happened with the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, full title BRCA, and then draw some lessons from those events. Uh, but first, as Mark suggested, um, I had some substantial contact with this activity. It so happened that both a major foundation, the Ford Foundation, and a minor government agency, the long-departed Administrative Conference of the United States, both asked me to review the operations of the IRCA program, and I did, and I spent a couple of years at it in Washington and in the field, uh, talking to the participants, the applicants, the regulators, it's the program's friends and the program's foes. So I have a, I have a bit of knowledge about that. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the act. The uh, environment at that time, uh, this is 1986 and, and the years before, was less partisan and um, more rancorous than now. Congress was divided. The House then was in the hands of the Democrats, and the Senate was in the hands of the Republicans. Um, and the Reagan administration wasn't doing very much in terms of, of writing IRCA. Um, they sort of sat back and let, let the Congress do it, which the Congress did do. Um, the key players at the time were the chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee, Senator um, Alan Simpson, whose absence from the Senate is regrettable, um, as is the absence of the ranking member of that time, Ted Kennedy. The two differed with each other on a number of issues, uh, but they got along in personally, and they, and they respected each other, and their staffs respected each other. Uh, it was, it was a, that was good. Uh, meanwhile, on the, on, the, on the House side, uh, Congressman Mazzoli of Kentucky was the ranking, was the subcommittee chair, and, and uh, Congressman Lung Lundgren of California, who just left the House, uh, was the ranking minority member. Um, and these folks are the ones that essentially put this together. The bill called for a couple of different kinds of things. One is, one is enforcement. It called for employers to verify the legal presence of their workers in the United States and created penalties if they didn't do so, and that was called employer sanctions. It also created, and this is IRCA, also created four and soon to be six separate legalization programs for different groups of unauthorized aliens. Each of the sub-programs related to a different constituency, each had a different set of eligibilities, some had different filing schedules, some had different reward systems. These complexities led to many administrative headaches and ultimately caused the program to be wider and more tolerant of fraud than had been expected in the first place. Let me just run through very quickly what these programs were, the sub-programs, if you will. The pre-1982 was the, was the prime program. This is for people who had been illegally in the country on January 1st, 1982, and were still there in the application period, which is in 87 and 88. And there were about 100, and, there was 1.6 million people who came through that, that program. Then there were the SAWS, and this is where most of the fraud was. Special, SAWS stands for Special Agricultural Workers. The requirements were, were much less strict for this group. They had to say that they had done 90 days of illegal farm work. In another category, they, they claimed 270 days of illegal farm work. Uh, and there were a lot of, a lot of folks uh, who <coughs> were fairly urban types, the lady in a mink coat who applied in New York City, for instance. There were 10,000 applicants for farm worker categories who lived in New York City. Uh, there were people who, when asked, well, what equipment do you need for um, picking strawberries? And somebody would say, well, got to have a ladder. Um, so there, there were some problems. Now, there were also some genuine farm workers who came forward and, and were, were approved, but there was a lot of problems in the SAW program. Now, that's the second. The third group were the Cuban-Haitian refugees who were then given legal status. Um, then there was another group, the registry group. They had been here since 1972, and that was obviously a fairly small group, uh, but there were special rules for them. 
Uh, a little later on, uh, there became a provision for the admission of about no more than 150,000 dependents of the primary beneficiaries. These were to be admitted outside the normal workings of the immigration law, which is extremely generous toward relatives, but this was 150,000 more. And finally, there were some folks from Uganda, Poland, I think Ethiopia, um, who were in what now would be called temporary protected status, TPS. And then it was called extended voluntary departure, which meant you didn't have to depart at all. And they were, they were encompassed in the program as well. So there were four, five, six different programs running at the same time, and the staff had to figure out what was, what was, who was eligible for which one, and it, it made things extremely and I think unnecessarily complicated. Let me suggest seven separate lessons that we can take from, from this, that experience in, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, first of all, <coughs> amnesties with, without real enforcement, such as IRCA, lead to just more illegal immigration, as my colleagues have said, and thus a demand for more amnesties. It's, it's a self-repeating process. Secondly, it's hard to administer complex, multi-part programs, uh, and any comprehensive immigration reform is likely to be, like, likely to have those characteristics. Smaller, narrower programs work better. There should be no programs specifically for farm workers. Agribusiness will surely distort and exploit a program were it to be enacted, which certainly happened uh, in the case of, uh, of the SAWS program. Uh, yes, there were individual farm workers or alleged farm workers who were getting their um, green cards illicitly, and then they're on a very broad scale agribusiness was encouraging that sort of activity. In fact, they, they, they funded several non-profits non to help farm workers apply, uh, despite very dubious um, <clears throat> records in many cases. Fourth thing was that the amnesty program is not something that you can turn on and turn off. Uh, within the packet that, you, that most of you got, uh, there's a package says backgrounder on it, uh, which I did. And in that, in that <clears throat> backgrounder, there is a table one, which shows for every year since 1988, the number of IRCA-related admissions. And they were still going through the process in, 19, in 2012. And it went on for 20, close to 25 years so far, and it's gonna keep going. Uh, so amnesties are forever, and uh, there's some statistics that sort of sort of prove, produce that. Uh, in addition to the three million primary beneficiaries, I count a little different than that table up there, which is 2.7 million. I, I think I have a better set of definitions, and I say three million people were were legalized. In addition to them, there was there's something like four different follow-on populations, not one, not two, not three. These are relatives who, who are seeking to come in or have come in or, her, or are here illegally um, who are related to the primary IRCA beneficiaries. So there is not just the, the initial number of folks who were apparently eligible or maybe not eligible who apply. There's this enormous follow-on, and this in turn has gummed up the... Um, the relative preferences, the backlog of relative preferences are something like four million worldwide. Many of them are in Mexico, many of them relate to IRCA, uh, and some people are waiting 15, 20 years to, to get in, or they're not waiting, they're in, in the United States illegally and, and hoping that their number comes up ultimately. So there's this follow-on. It isn't just the multi-millions that may now be eligible, it's the ones that they would bring in. So that's, that's a problem which is very rarely discussed. Nor is the question of fraud, and we've, talked a little, we've all talked a little bit about this, and, and fraud relates to the fact that there are people who want this benefit and who are not eligible, and the other fact, which is that the government isn't very strong about this. Now, in, 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 in Urca's days, the, the government insisted that saw uh, that that 
all legalization applicants be interviewed. Doesn't that sound like a sensible thing to do? But no, not now. DACA requires no interviews at all. There may be some uh, for special cases, but there is no routine interview. So you just simply file your papers and, and cross your fingers. But in the in IRCA, there was, there, there at least was a, a, a formal requirement that you actually had to talk to somebody. And, and as a matter of fact, the decision, however, in IRCA, and this is sad, uh, was not made by the, the first line interviewer. The decision was made off in one of the four regional offices by some people who were just looking at the paper. And one of the things that we found, my colleague and I, when we were doing this research, uh, was we found some unpublished INS data showing 882,000 legalization office recommended denials as of March 24th, 1989, and the total number of denials in the program was something like 300,000. So in, in half a million cases, the, the, uh, the um, back office staff, urged on by the leadership, said, no, nah, that's okay, they can, they can come in, even though the person who actually had a face-to-face -face interview said, I don't think this person is, is, is here legitimately. Um, one other instance of the way the INS faded in its efforts to, to defeat fraud toward the end, and this is something the Obama administration might very well do too, um, is that at one point an INS assistant commissioner, who will remain nameless, though I think he's still in the government, uh, though not an INS, uh, announced that they had $50 million in what he called excess application fees for the SAW program, so the government decided they'd buy computers with that. They, they wouldn't use that $50 million to f sort out fraud. They'd use that money instead to buy themselves a new set of shiny computers. Uh, so one of, the, one of the lessons that should be stressed in all this is that, A, you should certainly spend all the money that you get uh, from the application fees on the program itself and not, not let the money go to some other, other point. Finally, um, one of the things that uh, we, we've seen are these follow-on migrations um, that are sort of inevitable given the current state of the law. One of the things we might do if we do have another amnesty, which I think is a bad idea, we do one of two things. First of all, we might decide, and this would be the best, that we're going to get rid of a lot of these relative uh, provisions in the law that allows, you to, allows citizens and green cards to bring in their relatives, including if you get to be a citizen, you can bring in not just your brothers and your sisters and your sisters-in-law and your brothers-in-law, you can bring in your nieces and nephews. Now, somebody might regard that as nepotism, um, but it's, it's built into the immigration law now, and that obviously should go out if there's to be any kind of amnesty at all. The other possibility, which is a little less attractive, is to say to the newly legalized people, okay, you can spend the rest of your life here, you can be here illegally, um, but you're not going to bring in any, any relatives. So you have a, a, a different set of, of benefits to the newly legalized. And I think we should be very clear that we've got to have one or the other, or else we're going to have these follow-ons of millions and millions after the first millions and millions. So I would suggest that we think about that, and that's something that uh, I don't think the White House has talked about at all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, David.